like now to introduce the topic for panel five, which is strategic cultures of resilience and resistance, ally and partner perspectives. You've heard uh, throughout the, the forum that some of our European partners are much more adept uh, historically and presently and for resistance and resilience operations. So the next uh, panel is uh, made up of uh, our international uh, partners. Uh, moderating the panel and representing Poland is Colonel Jaroslaw Jablonski. Uh, Colonel Jablonski has been a member of the Polish Special Forces since 2002. He received his Master of Arts in Defense Analysis from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in 2009 and Ph.D. in Information and Knowledge Management in 2012. He has combined more than 40 months of deployment time to the Balkans, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Afghanistan in support of international security and assistance forces. At present, he serves as the Polish Special Operations Forces Exchange Officer in the United States Special Operations Command. Jaroslaw, we look forward to your and your panel's comments. Thank you very much, sir, for introduction. Um, this is the great opportunity to sharing, uh, sharing the uh, some kind of uh, good uh, insights from just like uh, you mentioned before from. Uh, uh, from international perspective. Uh, today I have the great uh, panelists uh, with me who represent very good, great nations. Uh, some of our uh, representatives are very close to uh, neighbor, neighborhood of Poland. Uh, so just like you said, uh, most of the nation who represent today uh, by distinguished guests uh, have very long uh, tradition resistant to silence. A very long tradition as a, as a country, long history. So I hope today we can provide some kind of uh, uh, good insight and good uh, information for uh, and lesson learned uh, from and perspective from international nation for our audience. But let me introduce the uh, our three panelists today. Uh, it's uh, we have the Lieutenant Colonel Jano Mark. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark joined Estonian Defense Forces 1995 as an infantry officer, and uh, he commanded Operation uh, and the Squadron level in the uh, LEOEF uh, as a part of the 212 CAF U.S. Army in the 2004. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark uh, uh, earned master degree from the Estonian National Defense Academy. Uh, followed by deployment in Afghanistan as an Estonian contingent commander. Uh, in, in 2009, he assumed command of the Viru Infantry Battalion in Northeast Defense Region of Estonia. And after competition of bat uh, battalion command, he was appointed to as a military assistant to the Chief of Defense, uh, prior to selection to the United States Army Command and College staff and the Scholar of uh, Adva School of Advanced Military Studies. Subsequently, he served as a commander of the Northern Defense District. He also graduated from the Estonian Business School with Master of Business Administration. More recently, he studied in the Baltic Defense College and at Higher Command Studies course. And after graduation, he was appointed to his current position as the chief of the G5 at the Defense League in the, uh, in the Estonian headquarter, main headquarter. Our next panelist is the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Marius Christiansen. He's currently serving uh, as a, my colleague with, uh, and co-partner with the, with the J3I as a Norwegian exchange officer. And uh, Marius is graduate from Norwegian Military Academy, and he gets the uh, bachelor degree of land for warfare in, and leadership. Uh, additionally, he's graduate University of St. Andrew in advanced certificate program in terrorist studies. And also, I'm very happy to hear this, he is the uh, grad from the Naval Postgraduate School uh, in defense analysis, irregular warfare. And uh, finally, he, he studied in the United States Marine Corps Command and General Staff College. And he 
his military service began in Norwegian Navy before he, trans he transferred to the Norwegian Army of uh, Special uh, Forces Unit uh, FSK. Uh, for his 18 years uh, career, he, he served almost every level of the Norwegian SOC organization, and he had the several combat deployments in Southeast Asia, Sahel, and Middle East. Uh, what is what I like to mention, uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Christiansen has his service also involved in enhancing uh, security cooperation on behalf of Norway in other allies and partners. Also, he has been working with issues like uh, diversity in the military, foreign fighters, military ethics, and how technological change may affect the security environment and the overall competitive environment. Our Next uh, third uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Uh, Bezins. He's, he's, he's the di director of the Center for Security and Strategic Research at the National Defense Academy in Latvia. He's one of the leading specialists of Russian military strategy in the world. His work focus of the uh, de 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 position between the theoretical development, development of Russian military through and the operational reality on the ground. This includes both the hybrid and the conventional aspect of warfare, such as influence, information, and the psychological operation. Dr. Berzins has lectured and guest in the United States, Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, Singapore, Belgium, Brazil, Estonia, Lithuania, and various academic and defense institutions. Uh, it includes the New York University, Johns Hopkins University, George. Marshall Center European uh, uh, in Europe for Security Studies, the Swedish Defense University, the Swedish Defense Research Agency, Norwegian Military Academy, US Army Asymmetric Warfare Group, the NATO Special Operation Command in Europe, and NATO SHAPE, Shape Brunsum Headquarters, and many others. Uh, Dr. Berzins has advised the United Kingdom House of Commons Defense Select Committee, Parliament of Singapore, Swedish, Swedish government, and important for me, the Polish government. He has advised to the Minister of Defense Signal Singapore about the strategic communication and influence, information and psychological operation. He has also provided expertise about the Russia doctrine for the US Department of Defense and Russia strategic issues for the private sector. Gentlemen, I am pretty much uh, uh, under huge uh, impression uh, what kind of panelists uh, uh, you are. You have both things. Uh, and we have the practical uh, ex uh, experience and the theoretical knowledge. And more, just like I mentioned before, you have the, you represent the country who have the long history and the long history of the resistance and resilience. Um, so let me start a little bit from the, from the history. My first questions would be, uh, how the concept of the silent and uh, resistant evolve in your country uh, uh, over the time. And uh, this concept will evolve in the special forces or also your armed forces or any other security uh, structure in your, in your nation. So we can start from the, uh, from uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark. So Mark, please over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jaroslav. And uh, can 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 you hear me? Uh, good. And Jaroslav, yeah, thank you for your kind introduction, and and thank you for having me. And as as already mentioned, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mark Estonian Army. I'm currently serving as uh, uh, Chief uh, Chief Five at the Estonian Territorial Defence uh, HQ, and it's it's my great privilege uh, to be part of this panel uh, discussing uh, Allied and. Uh, partners uh, perspective and, and actually I have also prepared a couple of slides uh, uh, to illustrate uh, my key points and, and could you please put them up and go uh, to the second slide yeah that one thank you uh, I would say uh, in in Estonian case uh, everything starts with uh, Estonian uh, constitution and where uh, chapter 54 uh, stipulates uh, that in, in, in the absence of other means of uh, opposing uh, a forcible attempt to change uh, the constitutional order of uh, Estonia, 
uh, every citizen of Estonia has the right to resist uh, such an attempt on his or her own initiative, which basically means that even if there is no uh, political decision or order, every Estonian citizen has the right to resist uh, such an attempt. And that lays, uh, that lays a fundamental ground for Estonian uh, defense system. Uh, the, the other document uh, I referred to uh, is uh, Estonian defense uh, strategy, uh, which uh, states uh, uh, if, if the state uh, temporarily uh, loses control over a part of its uh, territory, Estonian citizens will engage in uh, organized uh, resistance in, in, in that particular area. And both of, both of those uh, fundamental documents uh, uh, set the stage and, and uh, a huge requirement uh, for the government office, uh, Minister of Defence, other ministries, uh, as well as uh, for defence forces, uh, to build up uh, a comprehensive uh, or, or total defence uh, system achieving a citizen's readiness uh, for state defence and where each Estonian uh, can play his or, or her part in uh, defending uh, the nation. And such a, a comprehensive uh, or total defense system, if you will, uh, should also contribute uh, to build up more resilient uh, uh, defense forces, other government uh, institutions, as well as civil uh, society. And uh, yeah, probably that, that's it uh, for now from my side. Uh, I will, uh, you know, I would be more than happy to introduce. Uh, uh, our comprehensive defense system more in detail uh, during during our next uh, discussion point. And thank you. Back to you, Jaroslav. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, uh, explanation. You know that uh, at least I can say that uh, in Poland we have the perception you, you nation as a, uh, I, I never say so, small nation, but very solid nation. And who's pretty much well educated, uh, way we share the responsibility, for, just like you say, for all uh, citizens. You know the uh, the concept of the total defense. You, uh, you have many critics, but you know, uh, I grew up with the family who have the very strong uh, resistance uh, in during the communists and during the second war, and we cannot imagine that we can live without sacrifice for our nation, for our freedom. This means what you're doing in Estonia is pretty much very close to the same feeling which have in we have in Poland. Uh, and by the way, thank you very much that you government decides and support to our border uh, crisis with Belarus very quickly. And thank you for you for you for your detachment in Poland right now. We are very, very happy about that. Okay, the same questions for for Marius. Uh, Marius, please uh, share the uh, uh, share with us uh, your opinion and uh, your answer for the question about a little bit about the historical background, resistant or a silent uh, concept of the great Na Norwegian slash Viking nation. Over to you, Mar Marius. Thank you for those kind words, uh, Colonel. So if we look at this uh, from a theoretical perspective and use the model as described in a resistant operating concept from Secure with the conceptual, which conceptually communicates that resilience is the nation's will to maintain what they have and that resistance is the natural process from a sovereign government and the nation, the people, uh, when facing uh, multiple threats uh, to, to actually do something about it. Uh, then it's my heartfelt belief that the long-term societal and military preparations made before resistance is necessary will be pivotal. So from a historical perspective, you say we have a long tradition. I would uh, start at the Second World War. Uh, then it's the first uh, actually example I can, uh, I can use. With the framework I, uh, I outlined earlier here, uh, we can say that the level of resist uh, resilience in the Norwegian nation has evolved from a, uh, to put it uh, frankly, uh, a histor historic low. Uh, in 39, 1940, when the Norwegian government tried to stay neutral and Norway had a low level of military capabilities and the population at large did not commit enormously to the cause of defending Norway. Regardless, this changed and the motivation transformed to a really high level throughout the war. Uh, the exiled government uh, who went to the UK 
and the home front, together with important allies, really took up the fight and made uh, made a good example of uh, of resistance. So after the Second World War, supported by the Marshall Plan and different security cooperations and establishment of alliances, NATO uh, being the most important one, and yeah, from Second World War until uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, along with uh, several other partners, Norway focused on a military and security strategy that involved me- mobilizing large conventional formations in order to generate deterrence. Uh, the fact that many Norwegians had lived through the war and was committed in some of the large uh, conventional formations in some way or another, uh, we can say that everyone had knowledge about the military and cared about keeping what, what they actually had. So Norway utilized its constitutional conscript law in order to generate these formations with all male citizens. Uh, So all male citizens actually did at least one year of military service in order to fill these ranks. So throughout this period, uh, Norway uh, also committed quite large formations to US uh, peace and reconstruction efforts, both in Europe and other places. This led to a significant number of, uh, of the population actually uh, had experience throughout the war, Second World War, and some saw how this uh, war actually affected other places in uh, in the world. So um, this motivated them to keep what they had. So when the Soviet Union collapsed and the most significant security threat went away, Norway, as many others, reduced its conscripted military in size and uh, professionalized some of the soldiers in addition to some officers for its standing component. And Norway committed military forces to UN peace-related missions and allied coalitions, uh, coalition operations in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and the Middle East, to mention some. This led to a just small number of Norwegian citizens actually had to do military service, and even fewer actually conducting operations and see what what conflict and war actually does. So uh, also the level of military capabilities and capacities were reduced in this period. So in several years, the focus for military, for for the Norwegian military was out of area, uh, and not so much focus was placed on how to defend the actual homeland. This has now changed for sure. Uh, how we organize the fight or the response, if we should call it that, uh, when we start resisting, has also changed. In addition, we try to weed the attitude of resilience into the national cultural fabric. Uh, and how we do that has also changed. Norway, we use a lot, utilize a total defense concept. It is a whole of government approach and a whole of society approach. And this has been our concept for a long time, but this system is now revitalized. And it results in most members of the Norwegian society to actually have roles and responsibilities in order to handle these types of challenges. Also, the law of conscription was changed in 2014 to include everyone. It's now gender neutral. And all of these things have had a uh, huge impact on the Norwegian military and how, how it's viewed. So from my point of view, the military leadership in Norway is both personally and professionally committed in order to regenerate resilience throughout a comprehensive societal will to keep what we actually have. The chief of defense, who is a soft officer, General Eric Christofferson, he leads the way in this important efforts uh, and, and process, he's focusing on the most important element in this system, the Norwegian citizen. Female, male, old, young, gay, straight, Christian, Muslim, no religious belief at all, it doesn't matter. Everyone shall be given the opportunity to serve Norway throughout a contribution to the total defense concept if they want to in some shape or form. And that's uh, where we stay, uh, where we are at the moment. Thank you very much, Mario. So that was the <clears throat> very, gone, very, very well sum up. You know that uh, long, uh, long, uh, long history and uh, the the good concept of the Norway, uh, how we want to defend uh, country using their uh, 
resilience and the resistance uh, concept. Yeah, I see a couple, a couple common points between the Estonians and uh, Norway and Poland as well. So let me handle these questions to our third panelist, Dr. Janis Berzins, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to address you the same questions. And the first question of our panel, let's explain how the uh, Lithuania approach from a little bit with a little bit uh, historical background, how you built your resistant resilient concept uh, in the past and and now. Over to you, Dr. Bernice. Okay, thank you very much. It's uh, let me start saying that it's a pleasure and an honor to be in this panel with you discussing these issues which are of extreme relevance, especially for our region. And uh, as we've been seeing that, uh, that um, there are many actions in reality happening that are not necessarily uh, directly kinetic. And, uh, and therefore, the question of societal resilience is of extreme significance these days. And, uh, and um, well, uh, in Latvia, it's a, uh, it's, uh, uh, if uh, I was to speak purely as, as a citizen, I am quite happy to see what's been happening in the last years because it's uh, in comparison to, to, to the understanding of defense that was in the 1990s and one could say until around 2008, until Georgia, let's say, there was an understanding that in reality, Russia is a threat, but it's not a serious threat. Right, so we need to pay attention, but uh, it's it's a, it's, a, it's still not really uh, uh, it's a threat, but not like a like a NATO being a, a NATO member. It's it's enough as deterrent. And uh, and after Georgia, and then especially then after Crimea, after Ukraine, it became clear that that no, it's not the case. It's a, it's a Russia is flexing the muscles again, and uh, and it's becoming now like a, a different kind of threat. And uh, so, the first thing we did was to increase defense spending because we were doing really, really very poorly. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad that we increased defense spending and uh, now we are spending a even a little bit more than the 2% threshold. So our defense budget has, has been increasing, giving more, uh, more possibilities for the, the armed forces. And, uh, and um, well, in, in 2016, after the election of a new parliament, uh, the national defense concept included by the first time that Russia and what become, became known as hybrid warfare, the main threat for Latvia security. And there is a new version from 2020 that uh, uh, developed these ideas. And basically, so uh, 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 as a result, so, spending as a result a second point that is similar to Estonia is that we we also we changed the law about society participation in resistance because before 2015 it was it wasn't openly forbidden but it wasn't allowed people to take to resist so resistance should should be before 2015, an exclusive, let's say, uh, uh, endeavor of the armed forces. And now after the law passed, so uh, uh, people are, are, are allowed and stimulated to, 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 to collaborate with the armed forces in, in a model of, uh, uh, of comprehensive defense instead of a total defense, but comprehensive defense because the, the threat is comprehensive. The threat in reality, if you follow Russian uh, uh, doctrine, in reality, the Russian are very Clausewitzian and uh, the ultimate objective is not tactical, but political. And, and because of that, the Russian might use military instruments to achieve no military uh, uh, tactical goals, but may use also military instruments to achieve no military tactical goals because the ultimate point is political. Okay, that said, and, uh, and um, in resume, what we, what we did here is, uh, 
like a co comprehensive defense the objectives of comprehensive defense is maintaining the vital functions of the state to increase societal resilience protection of the information space, the sustainability of the national economy, non-governmental organizations and the church taking part also supporting society uh, uh, materially and psychologically and spiritually, and, uh, and uh, increasing civil resistance, cybersecurity and youth education, right? And then it's, uh, as we see it, it's that, uh, that uh, society has to get involved in the national armed forces to help organize resistance, to support incoming allied forces, to implement anti-mobility measures, to provide any kind of support for the national armed forces and the allied forces, including information exchange, supply of goods and services and other activities and measures, to take part in resistant movements, establish networks of supports, engage in passive resistance, for example, by not cooperating with the aggressor structures and by civil non-compliance, and, uh, and uh, maintaining the capacity and, and, the, uh, uh, and, and a effi an efficient functioning and continuity of state structures, define clear tasks and the role of a clear institution, continuity of, of vital functions, electricity, communication, financial services, and so on, that of vital importance because of Russian uh, uh, sixth generation warfare doctrine, uh, timely building and storing vital resources and raw material reserves and readiness to act in, in crisis and war situations across various societal levels, including individual civic preparedness. So, in short, that's it. I'm ready, like a, like a, I'm ready to go deeper <laughs> uh, 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 in case uh, uh, anyone has questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, answer. I, I want to highlight two four, two points for your uh, uh, answers. First of all, it's very good that you mentioned that uh, in in the little bit historical background that uh, the Georgia conflict, uh, Georgia war, was the hot washer for everyone to think that uh, the treats from the uh, east is uh, only the case. This is really happened. Our former president uh, Kaczynski. Uh, when he was in Tbilisi 2000, uh, 2009, he mentioned that uh, on, or in, during the, the, the meeting that uh, Georgia next probably will be the Ukraine, next one Baltic state and maybe, maybe Poland. We see the scenario is looks like that uh, very close to this. I hope maybe uh, one day we can start, we, we change this uh, definitely. Uh, the next point is that uh, uh, you mentioned this, uh, that uh, the treat, uh, from the east uh, is pretty much uh, uh, we have to provide comprehensive uh, approaches like in Estonia and Norway and our and Latvia as well and uh, because we have pretty much compound treats and our president uh, Dr. Wilson many times uh, mentioned it now is not the single treat we have the pretty much compound treat which consists with many different uh, problems and uh, our our uh, our uh, approach to this, to mitigate this, uh, uh, we have to we have to make the comprehensive and uh, compound uh, answer, just like the uh, total defense comprehensive uh, approach, all government uh, approach, and uh, and this is the best uh, the best uh, backbones, so, so, so spine points of the of the nation approach for such a uh, such a tweet. Thank you very much for the answer for the first questions, and I, I have the additional questions. Um, we are, we celebrate, not the celebrate, this is the year when, when we counting the 20 years global war of terror. So many nations uh, contribute uh, for that war uh, for 20 years. And with, from the other hand, we collect a lot of, a lot of lesson learned, a lot of best practices, uh, good practices. As uh, is uh, your nation uh, is, uh, uh, we see any kind of uh, lesson learned we can implement uh, from 20 years engagement with global war of terror to the concept of uh, resistant or silence. And we can start right now from Yano. Yano, please over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I don't have slides for for this point uh, discussion point. Uh, and I, I promise uh, to keep uh, this one uh, quite uh, short. Uh, Jaroslavia, you mentioned uh, 
a global war of, of terror. Uh, but uh, uh, considering uh, the current uh, attempts, uh, uh, let's say, great power competition area, and as uh, uh, autocratic regimes like uh, Russia and China are a threat uh, to Western liberal democracies uh, and to free and open open societies, uh, because they practice and, and promote uh, an authoritarian uh, and closed model as an alternative to the rule, uh, rules-based world, uh, trying to further their interests uh, at uh, other nations' uh, cost. I would say uh, that the most uh, most important uh, uh, lesson uh, lesson learned uh, and uh, how we should go further is uh, we should maintain and further strengthen. Uh, our, our solidarity, unity, and uh, cohesion at uh, political and uh, strategic level uh, to protect our common values and uh, rules-based world. And it's especially important for small uh, countries like uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, not mentioning uh, our uh, geopolitical uh, location and, and difficulties. And uh, our, our cooperation and uh, interoperability are probably uh, two uh, important aspects uh, to highlight uh, at operational and military level. And that's probably it for now from my side. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Jaroslav. Thank you, Jano. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, I think you pinpoint many good uh, uh, insights. Uh, you know that. 20 years experience working together with uh, our big ally, United States, and different allies uh, against uh, global terror brought a lot of experience. Now is the high time to implement them as quickly as possible in order to make the resistance <coughs> silence more effective. Thank you very much for for your answer. Now we can, I want to address the same question for the Marius. Marius, please, uh, over to you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, the overarching and kind of boring answer to this is that I think we should nurture the knowledge and experience of what one common cause led to of commitment from different partners, how it brought us together. Let's hope that this was my generation's war and that we don't need to engage in large conflicts in the future. So, so let's keep on building on the experiences we got and the relationship that already exists. I think that's the most important thing. But in order to be a little bit more concrete, what, uh, what uh, the global war on terror commitment actually led to, I think I would like to highlight some things. It, it led to a generation of new allied or partner soft units. New units were set up, that was really good. It, was, it led to an establishment of an overarching soft organization in NATO as of now, and it's HQ. Uh, it's uh, developed new types of soft units. We developed, developed and shared new technology. And uh, the same with techniques, uh, procedures, and tactics. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we generated a lot of local partner capacity in, uh, in, uh, in regions in the, uh, around the world, which, uh, which, are, uh, which needed that. So what led to this? It's quite challenging to point out one thing, but I will try. And from my point of view, I will say that the specific and dedicated or deliberate focus on developing relationships between people and organizations is the first part of the answer. The Global Soft Network, as you mentioned, is a good example. This is a combination, uh, this in combination with a common cause, an overarching arching strategic objective, Objective was essential as I see it. So my assessment is that the emergent international security environment requires the same level of cooperation, potentially even better and more extensive cooperation between partners uh, compared to the, the last uh, war. But the lack of one common cause and slightly differing national interests and strategic objectives makes this a little more challenging. But I am confident that trust between people will be what actually drives this forward in the way that we need. So in order to circumvent, uh, for example, info sharing challenges 
uh, we need to double or triple down on the efforts related to this particular element of this case complex. So uh, in, in danger of not being able to quote them correctly, I need to paraphrase, but uh, it's like uh, the reti retired uh, US Army generals, Anthony Sinney and Stanley McChrystal have com communicated earlier. Handshake con eats operational control for breakfast and we need to share until it hurts. So uh, my opinion, uh, and my opinion is that we did a lot more sharing and operated much more on handshake con in the global war on terror prime time compared to what they see now. So the trend I see is that we keep on degenerating some sharing and some cooperation, even though we still often experience that uh, it is when we share between partners and are flexible, we happen to find solutions to challenges. And often we also illuminate challenges we did not uh, know existed by including partners and the diversity these partners represent. So uh, with that, now it's time to walk the walk and not only talk the talk when it comes to partnerships. That concludes my uh, inputs for that. Outstanding answer, Marius. This is exactly what I expect from the Norwegian soft officer. Uh, thank you very much. That just like uh, uh, just like uh, Jano, you mentioned uh, uh, another key aspect, or this is the network, uh, net the power of the network. And uh, I, I would add something else that the crucial point between the every single network is the trust. So uh, so we we trust each other. I but we have to put as uh, allies and uh, on the different uh, upper level in terms of the trust. Everybody is waiting right now for the new security uh, uh, strategy who will be probably published in uh, US uh, national security strategy in uh, early this year and next year. So I think that, that most of the nation is looking for some kind of more details how the our US uh, uh, partner and just like in Poland and many places in Europe, we call it Big Brother, we want to uh, execute this kind of uh, network uh, improvement in order to uh, uh, minimize the compound treats from the different direction. Thank you very much to mention the network and, uh, and uh, how important is this for all allies working against the compound treats. Okay, now we can move to uh, to Yanis, Dr. Berzins. Uh, Yanis, uh, please uh, provide your insight uh, uh, for after 20 years of global war of terror uh, and any kind of lesson learned for for the resistance, re silence and resistant uh, concept. Please well, over to you. Thank you. And uh, and after uh, uh, two great answers, it's a uh, it's a. Uh, it makes my my job a little bit more difficult, but <laughs> let me try. I think the, the I, I want to 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 start uh, with trust because you just mentioned trust as 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 a fundamental aspect, and uh, I think that one of the 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 biggest lessons and one of the most important lessons is really trust not only within the soft community or the allies, but uh, it's trust with the local population. Because if you don't have the trust of the local population, if you, if you are unable to cultivate and to develop this trust, we won't win ever, right? Because the local population will be against us. And I think that not only from the 20 uh, uh, years uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I think that, like, uh, if you remember also the the operation in Bosnia, for example, uh, also trust was an issue, Bet trust between the NATO forces and and, uh, and the local population. So this is my first comment. My second comment is regards. Uh, um, if we think specifically about uh, special operation forces, is that in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we could see how really uh, um, many aspects, and then we can call as, as uh, 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 there are many, many terms for for these uh, non-linear warfare, asymmetric warfare, uh, uh, hybrid warfare, like a gray zone warfare, you mentioned it. And I think that, that uh, uh, what this uh, war shows is, uh, uh, this, this war, what these 20 years in this war of, of terror showed us is that uh, the, the possibilities 
of these non non regular yeah, methods, like the possibilities for for guaranteeing victory, they they have been increasing a lot, and therefore, uh, I think that maybe uh, the second most important lesson is that special operation forces, the role of special operations forces, is is maybe. Uh, Okay, maybe it might sign an exaggeration, but uh, is is like a overcoming the role of of convention of non-special operations forces, and I think that this is one of the most important lessons that uh, that we that results as a consequence that uh, that uh, I think at NATO level, at the partners level, we should uh, uh, not rethink, but we should to. We should reinforce uh, the collaboration that we have already, and uh, then it's just uh, like a like a like I think taking into consideration the answer of the colleagues. It's a it's a it's a, uh, a we have to to rethink to increase the the power of special operation forces because it's a it's a really it's a for me that's one of the biggest lessons there. Thank you very much, Yanis, uh, for, for for your answer and uh, that you additional make the emphasis or the emphasize the uh, soft uh, soft development to for future treats. Uh, in, in soft, as we know, we don't talk that usually. One of the true of soft is the well known uh, true is that uh, no uh, uh, no, uh, no more people are more important with the hardware and uh, uh, the quantity is. Uh, uh, less important than the quality. So I would say that uh, we, we are not going to create mass uh, production of the soft nowhere in in, in uh, probably in the across the across the globe. I even I see the different trends that some of the some of some some of the places will be minimized the the number of the the soft. Um, but uh, uh, because we are looking for different kind of speciality from uh, uh, from different uh, services in armored forces. And in, in some 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 of, some of the countries, um, because we, as we said before, uh, the 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 tweet which is from the east right now, we have to mitigate on the minimize, uh, not only by the uh, by the military hands, but also for the for the civilians and different kind of subject uh, uh, subject matter expert or doesn't matter what kind of gender, just like the Marius mentioned before. Uh, okay, now is the I want to address additional questions, uh, which is uh, uh, also related for our topic, of course. Uh, uh, do you see any particular part of the silence and resistance operation concept, which you would like to stress as the key point or key points to conduct successful national defense operation in the future? So, in other words, how we can in how you can how you can see the how we can improve resistant uh, operations concepts in the future let's say for the next 10 20 years because as we know our tweets from the west disappear cannot disappear um russia is where it is uh and uh, i think our successor will be dealing with this as well so let please share your insights uh, for our audience we can start from uh, uh from uh from Jano. Jano, please, over to you. Again, I would say uh, that for, for small nations like uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and Scandinavian nations nations as well, uh, having having also difficult, uh, quite difficult and complex uh, geopolitical location, it's not possible uh, to afford the large, all voluntary active duty force to effectively uh, defend the nation. So. Uh, we need a comprehensive or, or total, if you will, uh, approach uh, where resilient uh, civil society and uh, resistance operations play an important part. And uh, in, in, in Estonia, uh, we have a voluntary based uh, defense organization called the Estonian Defense League, uh, where uh, we, we are trying to build uh, uh, so-called FAE model, uh, which stands for uh, fighters, amplifiers, and enablers, uh, which uh, gives an opportunity for each Estonian citizen uh, to contribute uh, to national uh, defense. And uh, 
uh, this model also aims to prepare uh, those voluntary citizens uh, uh, for either amplifier or enabler uh, roles to support territorial defense um, uh, kinetic operations, as well as state uh, civil and institutions uh, and local municipalities and uh, local uh, population uh, itself. And this, uh, this model uh, also uh, increases uh, the civil society and local uh, population resiliency and uh, prepares them uh, for non-violent uh, resistance uh, if, uh, if needed. And under, uh, under resiliency, uh, I, would, I would like uh, to emphasize one more key point. Uh, as, we, as we witness uh, increasing uh, competition uh, between narratives, it's uh, extremely important to have resilient civil society against uh, adversarial information and uh, psychological operations uh, and warfare uh, to maintain uh, countries' uh, cohesion, uh, unity, and uh, defense will. So, yeah, I would uh, once again underline that uh, resilient uh, civil society is absolutely uh, key uh, moving, moving uh, from this point uh, further. That's, that, that concludes uh, my, my part for this discussion point. Back to you, Thank Jaroslav. You. Thank you very much, Jano. Uh, you again, you, very good. Uh, I like this kind of uh, uh, things that you mentioned. That uh, we have to look at for civilian society, and most importantly, we have to educate them. We cannot blame them that we are pretty much different generation of people uh, who grew up in our society, who are pretty much tied down with the, all the tech, high tech issues. And uh, we have to estimate them. We have to we have to be proper educational. Uh, program and train them uh, for the future. We're a different generation, just like we were. We were younger, and uh, we have to we have to reshape the education uh, and pre and preparation process uh, next generation for for resistance and resilience. And uh, you are as the uh, again not small solid nation. Uh, you are the representative for the solid nation, uh, who are the one of the best examples for the uh, education system which exists in the Europe. Thank you, for, thank you very much, uh, Jano, for for your answer. Now we can uh, switch to the Marius. Marius, please answer for for the same question. Over to you. Yeah, my answer for this one is going to be quite basic. Um, first of all, I would like to highlight that uh, you need to have the right capabilities. And these differ from, from country to country and AO to AO. And it's not going to be fun for anyone to be the grown up in the room and communicate that it's not always the cool stuff that actually makes the difference. And to be candid, uh, most likely, the future will not mainly require soft charging from horsebacks, light infantry units going into the woods with a lot of claymores, hand grenades, and general purpose machine guns or soft in CT gear, trying to blend in in order to be ready to strike high value targets on minutes notice. Um, even though all this sounds really cool, um, the future will most likely demand something more intelligent, uh, put it that way, and more complex. And my assessment is that most of the units of action when it comes to handling the future threats both left and right of bang, uh, need to generate more and other effects than purely the direct, the direct action related ones. And when you have the right capabilities, you need to have the right capacity. You need to have the right volume and you need to balance it out. And from, from the different uh, nations perspective, that will, that will be different. Uh, so you need to, to have the right volume of both capabilities and the resources. And the most important thing, and that loops back to what, uh, what uh, I think your Mark said, uh, you need to have political will. You need to have a political body that shows that there is an actual connection between the stated policies and action. Someone will just say that, yeah, that's to have an actual strategy, a simple one, but uh, that's, uh, that's what it is. And one of the policies should then communicate willingness 
to use the relevant capabilities you have generated if needed. This is related to the cons concept of deterrence, which resiliency and resilience relies heavily on, at least from a Norwegian perspective. Um, so simple, but still so challenging. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Marius, for the great, uh, great and wide answer. This yes, the, the future is bring us a lot of challenges without the political support and uh, uh, without a well estimation what we have in our uh, I/O and uh, all the history background, uh, all our lesson learned from the kinetic operation uh, environment. Uh, all these things uh, bring us to the point where we have to we have to estimate well and uh, before move the next steps uh, for the, any kind of resistance uh, concept in every single uh, country. However, I see the, the, the still space that uh, I think that every single nation have, the, have to need to take under consideration support for their neighbor, friendly neighbor, uh, because the, you know, the globalization also have the impact for uh, social movement across the, across the nation. And uh, we have to include the, some kind of uh, uh, neighbor support uh, in, in Europe for such a well-defined uh, future uh, resilience and resistant operation. Uh, thank you very much, Marius, for your answer. It was uh, very wide, uh, very to the point. Thank you very much. Uh, now we can move to Dr. Berzinski. I want to make a, 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 a reflection, maybe, because it's a, it's a, uh, um, we just talked about political will and, uh, and uh, like uh, to educate people about the, the, the political objectives of the military actions, but uh, but one thing it's a uh, it's a uh, very important and and uh, is this discussion between like what are the limits of the mili the mandate of the military forces because like a uh, a key characteristic of Russian military doctrine is to inculcate it, it is to 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 make the population of the country under attack to be ready to give up. Like, uh, we want to defend this state. And uh, there is, like, a, a saying, for example, I love this land, but I hate this state. And uh, the state, of course, being the political apparatus. So, take into consideration how the Russians see warfare. They very often derive that, uh, that annexing, taking territory and annexing to be part of Russia might not be necessary because it's complicated, it's expensive and so on. So that in reality, a change in the government might be the objective to have like a puppet government doing whatever Russia wants. And, uh, and if we start looking from this perspective and... Uh, and uh, Often there is uh, uh, the uh, the answer, for example, for for this information is that people should be educated. Yeah, that's the simple answer. But only by educating people, it's not enough because at the end of the day, if people disbelieve the government, if if people has no trust in the political uh, apparatus, in reality. It's not only about Russia, it can be any other country, for example, that wa wanting to engage in, in destabilization, like uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, relatively easy to achieve. Therefore, I want to, 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 uh, to say that in reality, it is about politics at the end of the day, but it's not only people should be educated, the politicians should do a better job. <laughs> The politicians, the government institutions, right? They should think like if you see data. We don't have time for that, but uh, but uh, I have a presentation on this. If you see data overall in the world about confidence in the government, confidence in in the system, it's extremely low, and that's problematic. And that's exactly what Russia exploited, for example, in Crimea and uh, in eastern Ukraine. Syria was a different kind of of operation, but exactly that, like that we are better than like uh, your model, like uh, it's better to be with us. So you see, that's why it has to be really a whole of society's approach, but it's not only educating people, it's like a politician should do a better job, in short. <laughs> 
Yanis, thank you very much for that you uh, that you touch this uh, issue. I like the, the education is not not only uh, to educate the citizens but also the politicians. This is our responsibility as well. Whenever we have the chance to talk with any kind of decision makers, we have. To, this is our obligation uh, that we, as the subject matter expert, we can tell in a comp uh, comprehensive way uh, our point and uh, solutions for the, and not blame from time to time all the politicians will make the wrong decision. Of course, there are independent people elected, but the, uh, sometimes I've, I have the personal feeling, I, I would say one more time, personal thing that this is our failure as a people who have the access to the decision makers that we don't present all the options for them and not we are not the patient to educate them uh okay thank you very much so now we have the uh, we can switch from uh, general questions or from me uh, we can switch to we have a couple questions for our audience uh so uh, we can start for the first question from uh, seeing looks from jso uh, team uh the question is since each of you are in proximity of Russia to various extents, have each of you also boosted the silence through increased defense initiatives? How do you view how do you view the Chinese advancement in the road? Uh, uh, this is the Belt and Road Initiative as a treat or no? Because we always talk about the we always talk about the Russians, but we know that. Chinese have a lot of investment for our regions. Marius, please uh, answer. Over to you. Yeah, when it comes to the uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, from a Norwegian perspective, um, where we um, see this and have to concretely actually um, do something about it or take take it into consideration is a better way to say uh, say is other places in the world than in our own region um but that might change at least when you look at the arctic and how the arctic is uh sailing up as a uh as a uh, uh, new way or a new ao that we need to uh, uh to look really into and uh, from from what I have seen uh, happening in the South uh, China Sea and uh, how things can develop if uh, if the ice uh, melts in the Arctic, uh, we can have some uh, some interesting discussions uh, in uh, in um, quite few years. I don't have anything more to add to to that point. Uh, thank you, Marius. Yanis, uh, please uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. I think it's a, it's a, if you go to to this geopolitical level, I think it's a, a we need to 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 take into consideration that yeah, China is like a there is a China's rise, of course. It's a it's a. And uh, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not possible to do any sort of containment in reality because China is too strong. And, uh, but one should take into consideration that like, uh, the methods, like if you are to compare Russia and China, the Chinese methods are different because Russia is going to be like a strong and uh, to, to show force and so on. And, but the Chinese comes, come with a smile, right? And uh, what the Chinese tries to do is to, basically, in Europe's case, has been to exploit economic interests. And even in Belarus, for example, if you see the Chinese presence there, for example, in terms of, of infrastructure, railways, and so on, it's huge. In Latvia, for example, uh, uh, Chinese presence, like a... So, like they are investing in companies, they are buying companies, and the idea is that the Chinese idea is that by gaining economic power, they will gain political influence. And uh, and then I have to joke because like the Chinese say they like to say that a win-win situation. And once I heard that for the Chinese a win-win situation is not a situation where both sides win, but it's a situation where China wins two times. And uh, and um, so I think it's a is a, 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 a in our region at least in the West I don't see uh, any 
at least at this moment, any sort of possibility of of increasing intensity. But uh, China is clearly clearly working to 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 achieve its objectives, and uh, I, I would say that that's not like a the road. It's it's a con the Chinese concept of the string of pearls. That is, each object is a, is a pearl in the string of pearls. Like a port in Africa is a pearl. Like a company in Latvia is a pearl. So, like I try to see this way, and uh, and uh, well, sooner or later it might be be some clash with Russia. The Russian military are not very comfortable with the, with China's rise, although there is this public rhetoric of best friends and so on. But uh, it's a it's a little bit more more, let's say, complicated than than that. Thank you. Yanis, thank you for your answer. And uh, Jano was back to ask. Uh, Jano, if you can answer for the question. Did you hear this question or I need to repeat this? Over to you. Yes, please repeat the question. Sorry, I didn't get uh, okay, the okay, Jano. question. The, the question was, the, uh, we are we, you represented. Uh, you are a representative of the nation, just like the rest of the panelists who are very close to the Russia. Uh, have each have you seen uh, any uh, boosted resilience uh, through increased defense initiative? Other words, can you see uh, uh, can you see any kind of resilience improvement uh, through increasing our your own defense initiative? So, do you have any kind of initiatives in the in Estonia who boosted your re silence? Over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the question. It's the right right question uh, for for Estonia actually. Yeah, we have um, uh, several initiatives uh, to boost uh, our uh, uh, societal resiliency as well as state institutions uh, resiliency, local municipalities resiliency, and so on and so forth. There are several several different uh, initiatives, and uh, actually, I, I prepared uh, uh, slides, but probably time is running uh, uh, up, and uh, we don't have time for slides anymore. But uh, uh, the model I referred to earlier, the FAE model, uh, which uh, Estonian Defence League, as a voluntary based organisation, is developing, uh, giving. Uh, uh, let's say vehicle or, or framework uh, for wider uh, society and volunteers to contribute to the state defense and uh, not not only in combat uh, and kinetic roles but also to be assigned in supporting roles uh, in non-combatant uh, roles and uh, I would even say that half of the organization would be in times of crisis uh, and war in supporting roles to support the territorial defense combat units, as well as state institutions, local municipalities, and so on and so forth. And also based on uh, this voluntary organization, uh, which is uh, considering Estonian, uh, uh, let's say, scale, it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, big organization with 20, uh, roughly 26,000 uh, members. And uh, uh, it, uh, and this organization uh, really contributes uh, hugely uh, to develop wider resiliency and also uh, non-violent resistance concept is mainly based on uh, Defense League. Defense League is a, is a government organization who is developing uh, non uh, a violent resistance concept, including not only Defence League members, but also the uh, wider uh, society and, and uh, citizens and local people uh, from uh, from places to be part of non-violent uh, resistance uh, if there is need or, or if needed. And yeah, the, to, sum, to sum it up, uh, we have uh, several several different initiatives, and uh, probably one more point. Uh, even though the overall responsibility to develop uh, resistance uh, concept uh, across the country lays uh, with government office, but Defence League is uh, mainly responsible to develop non-violent part of it. Okay, thank you. We have the one minute to end of our panel, so very quickly, 20 seconds for each of you. Question is, what the US soft have to do in, during the training with our forces, 
soft forces or the convention of forces in order to better help us to build our silent and resistant uh, concept. Uh, we start from the uh, from the Marius. Marius, over to you. Focusing on partnership, stop oversimplifying, and last but not least, stop generating buzzwords just for the fun of it. Perfect, Marius. Jano, over to you. I'm very sorry. Can you repeat the question again? But I didn't, uh, what, didn't catch your, the whole uh, question. What the US soft can do during the training with your soft forces, uh, your conventional forces, in order to improve the uh, resistance concept? Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Again, very good question. Uh, US soft uh, is, is already doing a lot of cooperation with the Stone and soft. And this is happening happening uh, uh, already uh, in, in, in our country. But uh, Estonian SOF uh, plays a bigger role in uh, armed resistance to build up uh, a countrywide or across the country armed resistance uh, system. And of course, uh, US SOF can, can, uh, can contribute uh, and help Estonians off to develop this system. And they can, of course, share uh, experiences. Uh, and it's not a one way road. I hope it would be uh, more like a two way road. And the US SOF can learn something from us as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anno. And yeah, finally, Yanis, please, for the quick answer, over to you. Okay, I liked very much both answers before me, and uh, I just would emphasize that collaboration is very important, sharing knowledge, sharing, uh, if it is the case, intelligence, and, uh, and, uh, but, but uh, I, I would emphasize to the, the issue of buzzwords. I think it's, a, it's a, like, a, like a, I think that the American soft, uh, uh, in, within this framework of collaboration, not only can can uh, uh, teach us, and, and but uh, I think that uh, because we are near Russia, that like uh, it should be interesting also to 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 share information, to train together, to collaborate regarding. Uh, uh, in, in relation to the Eastern threat without oversimplification, as Mary said. I like it very much, this idea of no oversimplification, because unfortunately, there are no simple answers. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for your answer, Yanis. And uh, unfortunately, we are over the time. And uh, I am very, that was my honor to, to, to moderate this uh, panel. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you virtually, of, uh, of course. I mean, Jano and uh, Yanis. Uh, with Marius, I have the privilege to work on a daily basis. Uh, so thank you very much to the JSO to give us the chance to provide uh, this kind of opportunity, like the panel, for present uh, your nation and your uh, perspective for resistance and resilience uh, concept. And the most important for me, uh, just like the Marius and Jano and the Yanis mentioned, uh, the network. So please stay in touch. And uh, it's always very important what we're doing uh, after the, this kind of event. And uh, we cannot uh, stop working on the on the resistance silence for on behalf of our uh, countries. And uh, I will stay in touch. I will stay in touch with uh, all of you. And whenever you have uh, some kind of questions or concerning JSA or the JFI. Uh, uh, unclassified way, unclassified way by biases. Please, please uh, reach me, and I will will be my privilege and honor to 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 work with you in the future. Thank you very much uh, for your for your participation and your insight. This brings to a close our panel five discussion. I encourage the audience uh, to sometime read about Latvian resistance during World War II and post-World War II. Uh, it's an incredible story.